Hi everybody, welcome to our module on the autonomic nervous system. Before we get started, let's review a little bit of vocabulary. There are essentially three nervous systems inside the body. The first one is called the somatic system, and this is a Greek word which means of the body. And this is a nervous system that controls our voluntary actions like of our muscles. So when you move or speak or pick something up with your hands, this is an action being done by the somatic nervous system. The second nervous system is the autonomic nervous system, and this comes from words that mean self-arrangement. And this is a nervous system that controls our involuntary actions. So things like salivation or vessel constriction or changes in our pupil size. No matter how hard you try to make your body dilate your pupil, you can't do that because it's not under your direct control. This is under the control of the autonomic nervous system. And then finally, the GI system has its own nervous system called the enteric system, which we won't talk about today. When the autonomic nervous system wants to carry out an action, say for example it wants to constrict a blood vessel, it does this by using what I call a two-switch system. So the brain will flip the first switch, switch number one, and then switch number one will flip switch number two, and then switch number two will go and create the physiologic effect. And so I've drawn this at the bottom in a little more detail. Here's the brain, and it sends a signal through something called the preganglionic neuron. That's the first switch in the system. This preganglionic neuron triggers the postganglionic neuron, which is the second switch, and that goes and creates an effect at the site. The place where the two nerves meet is called a ganglion. A ganglion is a cluster of nerve cells, and there are several of these in the body related to the autonomic nervous system. The way the first nerve and the second nerve communicate is through the use of neurotransmitters at the synapse. So a synapse is a space between two nerves where one nerve ends and another one starts. And the first nerve will release a substance called a neurotransmitter into the synapse. It will cross the synapse and trigger the second neuron to fire and begin to conduct an impulse. At the effect site, the second neuron will release a neurotransmitter onto the effect site and cause the desired action, for example, constriction of a blood vessel or dilation of the pupil or salivation. So all this is basic review of things you probably learned in college, but I just want to quickly go over it so we're all on the same page. So the two systems within the autonomic nervous system are the sympathetic and parasympathetic. And the sympathetic system takes care of what we call fight or flight, and the parasympathetic system takes care of what we call rest and digest. So let's go over some specific actions that these two systems carry out. I've listed on this page the major actions of the sympathetic nervous system. So let's talk about things that the sympathetic nervous system activates. Remember that this is a system that gets activated in fight or flight. So the way my med school biology teacher taught me to think about this is to think of our great ancestors with the woolly mammoth coming over the hill wanting to eat them. The sympathetic nervous system would activate and it saved some of our ancestors so that they could pass this system on to us. So what are the actions that the body wants to activate in that fight or flight situation when the woolly mammoth is coming over the hills? Well, it wants to dilate the eyes so that more light can come in and you can find places to go. It wants to dilate the bronchioles of the lungs so that more oxygen can get to the body to help you run away. For the heart, it wants to increase heart rate and contractility so it can pump more blood. In the liver, it wants to convert more glycogen to glucose so the body has fuel. In the kidneys, it wants to release renin so that salt and water will be retained so that you have that uh, to function inside the body. And then it will also increase activity of the sweat glands to help the body get rid of excess heat. Other parts of the body, the sympathetic nervous system wants to deactivate. These are things we don't want to waste energy on when we're trying to run away from that woolly mammoth. So in the GI tract, we want to shut down peristalsis. You don't want to worry about your GI tract moving when you're trying to run away from something. In the skin, we want to vasoconstrict because that's not important when we're trying to run away from something deadly. We don't want saliva or tears. Those aren't important to fight or flight. And we want to inhibit urination because there's no point trying to get urine out of the body when we're trying to run away from something deadly. So these are the major actions of the sympathetic nervous system. Now there are other actions like on the uterus and other parts of the body, but those are best understood in the setting of those organs. They don't really fit into the whole fight or flight paradigm as well as the things I've listed here. On this slide, I've listed the major actions of the parasympathetic system, which remember is the rest or digest system. And in general, the actions of the parasympathetic system are opposite of those of the sympathetic system. So for example, in the eyes, the parasympathetic nervous system can constrict the pupils. In the lungs, the parasympathetic system leads to constriction of bronchioles. 
the parasympathetic system chronically decreases the heart rate. If you cut the parasympathetic innervation to the heart, the heart rate will rise, and that's because it is constantly being suppressed to a mild degree by the parasympathetic nervous system. In the GI tract, the parasympathetic system promotes peristalsis, and then finally, it also promotes urination and defecation. In the bladder, it will constrict the bladder and relax the urethra. And many people will remember the actions of the parasympathetic system by the mnemonic SLUD, which stands for salivation, lacrimation, urination, digestion, and defecation. Vascular smooth muscle deserves special mention. So the sympathetic system constricts vascular smooth muscle for the most part. The one exception is muscle and liver. The sympathetic nervous system wants to increase blood flow to your muscles so you can run away, and it wants to increase blood flow to your liver so glycogen that's getting converted to glucose can be delivered to the body. So it vasodilates to some degree. The overall effect of activation of the sympathetic system is a higher blood pressure. The parasympathetic system, on the other hand, dilates blood vessels, but this is an indirect effect. Vascular smooth muscle does not have direct parasympathetic innervation. However, the endothelium does, which leads to the release of nitric oxide, which is also called endothelium endothelium derived relaxing factor. This causes calcium to efflux from vascular smooth muscle and it leads to dilation. So the net effect is that the parasympathetic system lowers blood pressure. And you're sometimes asked about this indirect mechanism of the way the parasympathetic system works to vasodilate. Let's talk about the anatomy of the two systems. So remember, all these systems have two nerves, a preganglionic and a postganglionic neuron. For the sympathetic system, nerves leave the brain and go down and exit the spinal cord and synapse at ganglia in the paravertebral area at the level of T1 to L5. So think about the implications of this. If the sympathetic nervous system wants to communicate with the eye, for example, it needs to send signals all the way down from the brain to the spinal cord, out of the spinal cord, synapse in a ganglia, and then go back up to the eye. This leaves a lot of opportunity for pathologic processes to interfere, and we'll talk about that when we talk about Horner syndrome. So important to remember that the sympathetic ganglia are outside the spinal cord at the T1 to L5 level. The parasympathetic system also has ganglia, but these are found in the brainstem, in the sacrum. They're sort of all over the place near their target organs. They aren't clustered in one area next to the spinal cord like the sympathetic nervous system. Next, we're going to talk about how the brain transmits signals to target sites using the autonomic nervous system. So recall that for both the sympathetic and parasympathetic system, there are two synapses within the system. The first synapse occurs as neuron 1 transmits its signal to neuron 2, and the second synapse occurs as neuron 2 transmits its signal to the target. And it's very important that you know for each synapse what the neurotransmitters are and what the receptor sites are that receive that neurotransmitter on the target neuron or target organ. So here is a very important picture that we're going to use throughout the rest of this module. It's our map of the autonomic nervous system and the neurotransmitters involved in the receptor types. So let's start up here at the top with the parasympathetic system. When the central nervous system wants to affect something using the parasympathetic system, it sends a signal down neuron 1 and it transmits across that first synapse using acetylcholine as the neurotransmitter. That's what the ACH is. And the receptor at this first synapse is called a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. And what do I mean by that? Well, it turns out there are two types of acetylcholine receptors in the body, nicotinic and muscarinic. The nicotinic ones are called nicotinic because in the laboratory, when you stimulate them with nicotine, they react. The muscarinic receptors are called muscarinic because when you stimulate them with muscarin, they react. Now, there's no nicotine or muscarin anywhere in the body. They're just named for the compounds that stimulate them in the laboratory. But you need to know that there are two types, nicotinic and muscarinic. So the first synapse in the parasympathetic system is an acetylcholine neurotransmitter nicotinic receptor. The second synapse between the second neuron and the target site is an acetylcholine muscarinic receptor. Now let's talk about the sympathetic, and that's shown on our map here by all of these structures in here. So recall that the sympathetic nervous system has its first synapse in the paravertebral ganglia. So the first synapse for all the structures the sympathetic nervous system innervates uses acetylcholine for its neurotransmitter on a nicotinic receptor, and that's what's shown in here. When you're talking about sweat glands, the sympathetic nervous system uses acetylcholine on a muscarinic receptor to stimulate the sweat glands. For other targets in the sympathetic system, the second neuron uses norepinephrine as its neurotransmitter. That's what this NE is right here. And it stimulates alpha and beta noradrenergic receptors. We'll talk more about those in a little bit. Now, also shown here are the dopamine receptors. The sympathetic nervous system uses dopamine in some cases, generally in the, in the renal area and somewhat in smooth muscle. 
Now down here at the adrenal medulla, the sympathetic nervous system can stimulate the adrenal medulla to release epinephrine and norepinephrine into the bloodstream. And it does this via a nicotinic receptor with acetylcholine as the neurotransmitter. And then finally, just for completeness sake, I've drawn a somatic skeletal muscle down here. That is not a two neuron chain, it's a one neuron chain, but somatic skeletal muscle uses acetylcholine as the neurotransmitter on a nicotinic receptor. So there's a very important slide and it's very important you understand all the different neurotransmitters and receptors used in the autonomic and somatic nervous system. Before we go any further, let me make just a couple key points about our overview of the autonomic nervous system. The first one is that norepinephrine is the main neurotransmitter for the sympathetic system. It's responsible for most of the clinical effects. There are just a couple of exceptions to this rule. The sweat glands use acetylcholine on a muscarinic receptor for the sympathetic system. The adrenal gland uses acetylcholine on a nicotinic receptor, and then there are some dopamine structures. Acetylcholine on muscarinic receptors is the main system for the parasympathetic system. Most of the clinical effects of the parasympathetic system are mediated through muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. And then finally, acetylcholine on a nicotinic receptor is the main system for somatic muscle. There are nicotinic receptors in the first synapse for the sympathetic system and the parasympathetic system, but these don't have many clinical effects. By and large, when you activate or block nicotinic receptors, you are going to affect somatic muscle. And if you can remember that, it's a very helpful rule of thumb. So now let's zoom in on an acetylcholine synapse and talk about exactly how acetylcholine is synthesized and released into the synaptic cleft. The process begins with a molecule called choline, which is transported into the neuron and reacted with acetyl-CoA. Together, they form acetylcholine, which is then packaged into vesicles by an enzyme called choline acetyltransferase, which is abbreviated CHAT. When the neuron depolarizes, the vesicle then fuses with the membrane and exocytosis occurs, and the acetylcholine is released into the synaptic cleft to exert its effect. I've summarized on the bottom left of the screen here the process by which acetylcholine is released into the synaptic cleft. It's stored in vesicles, as I said. Depolarization leads to calcium influx, and the calcium influx triggers exocytosis of the vesicles, and then acetylcholine is released into the synapse. Once it's in the synapse, it can be broken down by a very important enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. We'll talk in a little bit about how some drugs inhibit this enzyme to raise acetylcholine levels. And once acetylcholine esterase breaks it down, it goes back into choline and acetate, and the choline can then potentially be recycled. There are a couple of drugs that interrupt this process that you should know about. The first one is called hemicholinium. This is a research tool. It's not used clinically, but it blocks the transfer of choline into neurons. Another drug that blocks this process is called vesamicol. It's not used clinically, but it's used for research purposes. It blocks choline acetyltransferase from packaging acetylcholine into vesicles. And then finally, botulism is a disorder where patients are exposed to botulinum toxin from a bacteria, and this blocks the release of acetylcholine into the neuromuscular junction. And botulism is heavily tested on the boards, so let's talk about that now. So botulism is a paralytic neurotoxin created by a bacteria called Clostridium botulinum. It's paralytic because its main effect is on blocking acetylcholine release in the synapses of somatic muscles. There are three ways people get botulism from food in wounds, and there's a special way for infants. Let's talk about the food one first. So if people eat undercooked food, especially canned food, where the anaerobic environment in the can promotes bacterial growth, they can actually ingest the toxin directly. And the way you're going to see this on a board question is going to be multiple sick adults after a meal. People can get bacterial growth in a wound with C. botulinum, and then there's a special form of botulism that happens to infants. They ingest the spores, especially in honey, and the spores grow in their small intestine and create the toxin. We don't really understand why infants are so vulnerable to this, but a lot of mothers will not give their babies honey over concern for botulism. The symptoms occur about a day or so after ingestion, and you can remember the three Ds. So diplopia, which comes from paralysis of the eye muscles, dysphagia, because people can't swallow, and dysphonia, which is difficulty speaking. These are all because the muscles of the head are not working properly. These are all because of nicotinic blockade. Remember, botulism blocks that acetylcholine release into the synapse. The treatment is with an antitoxin, which blocks the circulating toxin, but this doesn't do anything for the toxin that's already in nerves. So people with botulism do have to just wait for it to wash out, and sometimes they need supportive care in an ICU. This is really rare. The CDC only reports 100 or so cases a year in the U.S., but you do need to know it for your board exams.
Now, what you will hear about clinically is something called Botox. So this is synthetic botulism toxin, and it's used to paralyze muscles. And why would you want to do that? Well, cosmetically, this is often used to flatten the muscles of the face and limit wrinkles. And then there are certain patients with neurologic conditions who have spasms and dystonia. So botulism toxin can be used to relax their muscles. Okay, so next we're going to zoom in on a norepinephrine synapse and look at what's happening here. So for a neuron to release norepinephrine, it needs to synthesize it first. And the way it does that is by transporting tyrosine into the cell. Tyrosine gets converted to dopa, and dopa gets converted to dopamine and packaged inside a vesicle. The dopamine then inside the vesicle is converted to norepinephrine, and then when the nerve depolarizes, norepinephrine is exocytosed and dumped into the synaptic cleft to exert its effect. I've described the process for exocytosis down here, just like I did on the last slide for acetylcholine. So norepinephrine stored in vesicles is released after depolarization, which causes, again, calcium influx, and it's high yield to remember that. The calcium influx causes exocytosis of the vesicles, and that's how norepinephrine gets into the synapse. There are a couple of receptors on the presynaptic neuron that feed back on this system. So there are muscarinic receptors called M2 receptors. M2 is a subtype of muscarinic receptors. And they feed back on this system and block norepinephrine release. And this is one way by which the parasympathetic system can shut down the sympathetic system. Angiotensin II, which is released by the kidneys when it wants to retain salt and water, can activate this process so that you get more norepinephrine release. And then finally, there are receptors called alpha-2s on the presynaptic neuron, which sense the norepinephrine in the synaptic cleft and shut down this process. It's a way that the neuron can sense that it's released enough norepinephrine and can stop itself from releasing more. Just like acetylcholine, this system has a couple of important inhibitors that you should know about. The first one is metyrosine, which I've drawn up here. Metyrosine inhibits tyrosine hydroxylase, which converts tyrosine to dopa. And the only real clinical use of this drug is in pheochromocytoma. So people with pheochromocytoma have massive norepinephrine and epinephrine levels in their body. And this will shut down the production of that by neurons. And that's the only time we really use it clinically. Reserpine is a very old hypertension drug. It blocks the enzyme that packages dopamine into a vesicle where it's then converted into norepinephrine. This was one of the first hypertension drugs used in the 1960s. Uh, it had a lot of side effects. In particular, it depletes dopamine so much it could cause a Parkinson-like syndrome. And people sometimes use this in the treatment of Huntington's disease because that condition is associated with high and excess levels of dopamine. Guanethidine right here is also a very old hypertension drug that blocks the release of norepinephrine epinephrine, it's not used anymore. Bertillium is another old drug not used anymore that blocks the release of norepinephrine. Bertillium is also an antiarrhythmic that used to be used a long time ago. If you listen very carefully in the movie E.T., when they think that E.T. is dying, they administer Bertillium to try and resuscitate his heart. And that movie is from the early 1980s, which is probably the last time anyone used Bertillium. Amphetamines promote the release of norepinephrine into the synaptic cleft. They also block its reuptake here, so they greatly increase the amount of norepinephrine. Systemically, this gives effects like hypertension and tachycardia, but they also induce central dopamine release, and that's what gives people a rush when they abuse amphetamines and use them as a stimulant. And then finally, cocaine and tricyclic antidepressants block the reuptake of norepinephrine. So this is why people who snort cocaine and some patients on tricyclic antidepressants can get hypertension because there's more norepinephrine around to stimulate the body. So let's review cocaine intoxication because this is often heavily tested on the boards. It inhibits the reuptake of norepinephrine, also dopamine, also serotonin. This makes patients agitated. It gives them hypertension. Their pupils will be dilated because the sympathetic system is ramped up. They can get chest pain from coronary vasoconstriction. And you should look for abnormal nasal mucosal or septum. This is often a tip-off in a board question that they're talking about cocaine. Now, just a note here, cocaine also blocks sodium channels, and that's why it's a local anesthetic. But that's a completely separate mechanism of the drug besides what we're talking about here. So there are several subtypes of norepinephrine receptors that you should know about. So the first subtype is called the alpha-1 receptors. These are found in the peripheral vasculature. So in blood vessels, they cause vasoconstriction and raise the blood pressure. They're also present in the eye, where they cause dilation of the pupils. That's called medriasis. Then there are alpha-2 receptors in the central nervous system, and we just talked about those on the last slide. They're a presynaptic neuron receptor, and they feed back to the nerve when norepinephrine is released. So activating the alpha-2 receptors leads to less norepinephrine. They're also found in the pancreas, where they inhibit insulin release. 
Beta-1 receptors are found in the heart and kidneys. In the heart, they increase heart rate and contractility. In the kidneys, they stimulate renin release from the juxtaglomerular apparatus. And then finally, beta-2 receptors are found in the periphery. They bronchodilate the lungs. In liver and muscle, they cause vasodilation. So remember, the sympathetic nervous system mostly causes vasoconstriction, but the two exceptions are liver and muscle, where you want more blood flow during the fight or flight response, and the beta-2 receptors are responsible for that. In the gut, they shut down motility, and in the bladder, they promote relaxation. You should make sure you can keep straight the different receptor types and their effects on the hemodynamics in the body, so I've summarized them here just to review what we said in the last few slides. The alpha-1 receptors cause vasoconstriction. The alpha-2s cause vasodilation by negative feedback. The beta-1 receptors increase the heart rate and the beta-2 receptors cause vasodilation. If you stimulate all receptors at once, you get increased heart rate and increased blood pressure. In the last few slides leading up to this one, we zoomed in on acetylcholine and norepinephrine synapses, and we looked at how the neurotransmitters were synthesized and how they were released into the synaptic cleft. Now we're going to look at the receptors on the other side of the synapse and talk about how they respond to the neurotransmitter. And the first receptors we'll talk about are the nicotinic receptors. And I've circled on our map here where they're found. They're found in the first synapse of the parasympathetic system, the first synapse of the sympathetic system. They're found in the adrenal medulla, and they're found in somatic skeletal muscle. And the way these receptors respond to neurotransmission is through something called ligand-gated ion channel. So what do I mean when I say that? Well, a ligand-gated ion channel is a protein that's in the cell on the other side of the synapse. And when it is triggered by acetylcholine, it opens up and allows ions to pass through. Usually they're sodium or potassium, but some channels have chloride or calcium. And when those ions pass through, that triggers the response from the skeletal muscle or from the neuron on the other side of the cleft. And that's called a ligand-gated ion channel, and that's the way all nicotinic receptors work. So the nicotinic ones are easy to remember because they're ligand-gated ion channels. The muscarinic and adrenergic receptors are more complicated. They use something called G-proteins to stimulate their effect on the target neuron or the target organ. So G-protein receptors are this big family of protein receptors that sense molecules outside the cell and then send a signal into the cell to create the effect the body wants. So there are three types of G-proteins you should know about. The first type is called GI, and it's called I because it's inhibitory to adenylate cyclase. I'll talk more about that in a minute. The second type is called GS, and the S is for stimulatory to adenylate cyclase, and the third type is called GQ. So let's take a closer look at how a GS and a GI system would work in cardiac muscle. Suppose, for example, that this GS protein right here were stimulated. That would then activate adenylate cyclase, which would convert ATP to cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP would then activate protein kinase A, which would promote the entry of calcium into the cell. Calcium would be taken up by the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and then there would be more calcium to dump when the sarcoplasmic reticulum unloads. This would lead to more contraction in the cardiac myocyte. By the reverse logic, if you activated the GI protein, you would get less calcium and less contraction. So in cardiac muscle, stimulation of GS proteins leads to increased contraction, and stimulation of GI proteins leads to decreased contraction. It gets a little more confusing when you talk about vascular smooth muscle over here on the right side of the screen because the effects are a little bit different. So stimulating a GS protein, for example, this one right here, would stimulate adenylate cyclase. All GS proteins stimulate adenylate cyclase. That's why they have an S. ATP would still get converted to cyclic AMP. All that is the same. But in vascular smooth muscle, cyclic AMP inhibits myosin light chain kinase. And recall that the purpose of myosin light chain kinase is to work with calmodulin and calcium to cause contraction of vascular smooth muscle. So stimulation of the GS protein leads to an inhibition of myosin light chain kinase and less contraction, or in other words, relaxation. By the reverse logic, if you were to stimulate this GI protein, you would get contraction of vascular smooth muscle. So the effects are somewhat opposite. Stimulation in cardiac muscle leads to more contractility. Stimulation in vascular smooth muscle leads to relaxation. This is one of the confusing things about G proteins and why it's hard to remember what they do. They are named for their effect on adenylate cyclase, whether they stimulate it or inhibit it, not for their ultimate effect on whether they cause more contraction or more relaxation. Now let's look at the GQ system, and this is only found in vascular smooth muscle. It's not found in the heart. So if you stimulate a GQ protein, it will activate phospholipase C. Phospholipase C, which is right here, in turn hydrolyzes PIP2. PIP2 stands for phosphatidylinositidyl, 
and that gets converted to IP3, which is inositadyl triphosphate. IP3 activates the sarcoplasmic reticulum to dump calcium, and this causes contraction. So the bottom line is that stimulating GQ proteins will lead to contraction in vascular smooth muscle. So I've shown on this slide all the different receptor types and which G protein class they use. So alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, and beta 2 are the sympathetic nervous system receptors. They are up here at the top. M1, M2, and M3 are the three subtypes of muscarinic receptors, and they're right here. Also down at the bottom, I've shown the two dopamine receptors, some histamine receptors, and V is for vasopressin. All of these use G proteins. These G protein receptors are ubiquitous in the body, and they've been found in many different neurons and target sites. I think it's really not fair on your boards to test you on which ones go with which receptors because it's really just an exercise in memorization. But if that does come up, there's a mnemonic that people use to remember. So the GQ proteins right here are found in H1, alpha-1, V1, M1, and M3 receptors. So people will remember have 1 M and M to remember where the Q G proteins are found. GI proteins are found in M2, alpha-2, and D2, so people remember this by MAD2. And then the GS proteins are found in all the other receptor types. Hopefully they won't ask you about this on the boards. So we've covered a lot in this module, but let me just leave you with a couple of take-home points of how I keep all this information organized in my mind. I first look at it from the big picture overview. We started talking about the sympathetic nervous system versus the parasympathetic versus the somatic and what each system does. We then drilled down to a lower level and we saw that the sympathetic nervous system largely uses norepinephrine on alpha and beta receptors. The parasympathetic system largely uses acetylcholine on muscarinic receptors and the somatic system largely uses acetylcholine on nicotinic receptors. We then drilled down to an even smaller level and saw that the somatic system and the nicotinic receptors use ligand-gated ion channels, and the sympathetic and parasympathetic use a mixture of GI, GS, and GQ protein second messenger system. And that concludes our module on the autonomic nervous system.